Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Dr. Carl Sharif al Tugi. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. It's a pleasure to be on. Sharif is Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies at Brandeis University in the United States. His expertise is in Islamic thought, particularly Islamic theology, law and jurisprudence, and also uh, in the Arabic language, Quranic, classical and modern, and classical Arabic literature and poetry. And he's also interested in the uh, relationship between reason and revelation, particularly pertinent to our discussion today, and the whole issue of religion and modernity, which he has discussed at length on other videos, which you can watch on YouTube. Sharif has kindly agreed to discuss his fascinating book called Ibn Taymiyyah on Reason and Revelation, a study of in English, refutation of the contradiction of reason and revelation. And here is my copy of the said book. There we go. It's quite a, a thick tome. Uh, you can actually read this for free in a PDF format. Um, I'll link to it uh, in the description below, published by Brill Publishers at brill.com. And is an absolute, I mean, I don't usually spend my days reading PhD dissertations, but when I do, this is certainly one of the more readable ones. <laughs> uh, I actually, I really uh, enjoyed uh, reading it, to be honest. Now, just to give uh, viewers the heads up uh, that this talk will be unashamedly academic in tone. And uh, as we explore aspects of the thought of one of the most, I think, misunderstood Islamic thinkers of all time, who remains controversial in some circles today, as you probably know. Now, a succinct summary of Sharif's fascinating book on Ibn Timmy is found on the back cover. And I just want to read it to you. And it saves me having to paraphrase what it's all about. But it's quite a concise um, definition of what this book is about. It says, in Ibn Taymiyyah on Reason and Revelation, this book, Karl Sharif al Tubgi offers the first comprehensive study of Ibn Taymiyyah's 10 volume magnum opus, which in English is Refutation of the Contradiction of Reason and Revelation. Uh, in, this, in his colossal riposte to the Muslim philosophers and rationalist theologians, the towering Hanbali polymath, that's Ibn Taymiyyah, by the way, uh, rejects the call to prioritize reason over revelation in cases of alleged conflict, interrogating instead the very conception of rationality that classical Muslims had inherited from the Greeks in its place. Ibn Taymiyyah endeavours to articulate a reconstituted pure reason that is both truly universal and in full harmony with authentic revelation. And this book is based on a line-by-line -line reading of the entire work. al Tubgi's careful study carefully elucidates the philosophy of Ibn Taymiyyah as it emerges from the multifaceted ontological, epistemological, and linguistic reforms Ibn Taymiyyah carries out in this pivotal work. So there we are. I did say it would be uh, academic in tone. And I'm not going to go through all of those expressions and define them, but you can, as I say, read this uh, for yourself, which does actually have um, a fantastic glossary of Arabic terms at the back, pages and pages of glossary of proper names, fantastic bibliography, uh, index of, uh, so it really is fully annotated in a very kind of reader-friendly way, I think. But anyway, back to um, the subject. Could you, um, Shav, could you give us a, a brief overview of the life of Ibn Taymiyyah, who I understand died in 728 of the Muslim era, uh, the Muslim calendar, uh, that is about 1328 of the common era. Yes, sure. Um, before doing that, however, I just want to point out that the book um, also has come out as a paperback this year, just a couple of months ago. So um, it is available for free online from the Brill website because it has been published open access. So you can, anyone can download the entire book and print it out for free. But if people do want to have a physical copy, you have the hardcover, which is uh, you know $140, 
Uh, I wouldn't buy it probably for that, but the, the soft cover uh, paperback is, is less than half the price. It's still a bit pricey, but I think more manageable. So that is another uh, option for people who would like to have a physical copy of, of the book. Um, yeah, so in terms of Ibn Tamiya, he was born in 661 uh, or 1263 of the Common Era. Uh, and he was born in, uh, well, he was born in a town of Haran, which is close to modern day Syria. And his family fled uh, before the Mongol invasions. The Mongols were invading from the east at this time. And so his family fled Haran uh, further east, in, or sorry, further west into Damascus. And they settled in Damascus in the Hanbali sort of quarters where the, the people um, of the Hanbali law school were located. And so he was raised as a Hanbali. Hanbalism is one of the four um, principal uh, Sunni schools of Islamic law. Um, and so Ibn Taymiyyah was raised as a Hanbali. Uh, Hanbalism is both a legal uh, school and an approach to derivation of the law, as well as a theological orientation. So he was a Hanbali both sort of legally and theologically, we can say. And he uh, was raised in very tumultuous circumstances. As I mentioned, the Mongols were kind of invading and pinging upon northern Syria. They had taken surrounding lands and were threatening to invade Damascus. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, as a young man, actually um, fought against the Mongols on several occasions. I mean, literally fought in battle against them. He also negotiated with them on, on one or two occasions, negotiated the release of prisoners that they had taken and so forth. Um, and uh, so just, just, fighting... Sorry, just interrupt you, sure. Those prisoners, he he uh, negotiated with great personal risk to himself because he personally went to the Mongol um, uh, uh, attacker. Uh, these included non-Muslims like Christians, for example, That's right. who had been taken yes. hostage. So here, Ibn Taymiyyah pleading at great personal cost for the freedom of Christians and, and Jews and others from the hands of the tyrant. I just wanted to, to stress that, given certain perceptions of Ibn Taymiyyah in the world today. Right, and the reason he did that too is because Christians and Jews and other groups under Islamic law are considered to be protected peoples, or dhimma. Dhimma means to be in the protection of, of the state, basically the Islamic polity. And so Muslims are, are, are duty-bound by law to actually protect uh, the non-Muslim communities that live within them. So if they're attacked, the Muslim state actually has to come to the defense of them. It's part of the contractual agreement between the Muslim polity and uh, its non-Muslim subjects. Okay. So he was perfectly also in line with, with Islamic law in doing that as a duty, you know, as, as a Muslim. Um, and so he had a very sort of uh, tumultuous life. Uh, his times were tumultuous politically. Syria at the time and Egypt were being ruled by the Mamluk dynasty, which was one of the sort of later successor dynasties after the Abbasid dynasty falls apart. Baghdad, of course, is invaded in 1258 by the Mongols. So the Abbasid Empire, which lasted some 500 years, officially comes to an end in 1258. And Ibn Taymiyyah is born 661, so just a couple years after that. Um, he spent most of his life in Syria, but he also spent a number of years in Cairo and went back and forth several times between the two countries. Um, and in addition to the political sort of commotion that was going on, he also um, was involved, I could say, in intellectual and uh, spiritual pursuits and conflicts as well. And the reason for that is that he um, critiqued and criticized a number of uh, theses that were held uh, by the majority of the uh, scholars around him by his time who were mostly Ash'ari in their theological orientation. Ash'arism is one of the main, uh, or the sort of main stream later school of rationalistic Islamic theology. Uh, and the vast majority of scholars by Ibn Taymiyyah's time, especially in the lands in which he lived, were Ash'ari by theological uh, persuasion or, or commitment. And he had a number of, of, of uh, critiques to make against the Ash'ari approach to theology, some of which you know, come up in this book uh, on reason and revelation, in which he's responding to Ash'arism specifically, later Ash'arism, and also to the philosophers. And he sees the Ash'aris having been influenced more than he would like by the philosophers. And for that reason, they both kind of come into his line of fire. And so because of these, um, because of his the falling out that he had with a number of scholars at his time, both for theological issues and also legal issues, because he took some positions on legal uh, matters that were seen to go against or that did go against, in some cases, a consensus of scholars. He was actually imprisoned on a number of occasions. Um, he was accused of anthropomorphism. And, uh, and, and brought to trial on that. Although, you know, in every case, um, you know, when his case was heard, the charges were normally dropped once he could get into the details of what he meant. I think some of his language on the surface seems to be quite anthropomorphic, but when he was able to explain his position, usually the case was dropped against him. But nevertheless, he did run into um, 
problems with the local authorities, uh, both in Syria and in Egypt, as well as the scholarly establishment, mm -hmm. theological, legal, and Sufi kind of scholarly establishment. And for that reason, spent, I think, a total of something like six years of his life uh, in prison on wow. a number of different occasions. And he actually died in prison in the citadel in Damascus uh, in the year 728 slash 1328 of the Common Era um, uh, after a several month imprisonment, towards the end of which he was deprived of ink and pen and yeah. pens and was not able to write. And because he was so prolific and so engaged, it, I mean, it almost seems like he died of chagrin mm -hmm. by the uh, by the fact of not being able to to write and to produce and to communicate. I mean, who knows? I mean, he might have died of some other reason, but it seems like is yeah. no sooner what were his pen and paper taken away than he died, you know, like shortly thereafter. And so it's it interesting. Like in, in, in those days, before he, he uh, that, that last episode of imprisonment that you just alluded to, in the other episodes in prison, he was allowed to read uh, and write and have books and pens and guests yes. and disciples and students. And so it wasn't quite like a, a maximum security uh, prison in the United States or Britain, exactly. for example. It's, it was slightly more open uh, and uh, he could he could flourish as a scholar, it, just, it would seem, even in right. those circumstances, apart from the very end when uh, the authorities got really nasty for some reason. And, right. and a number of his books were actually written in prison. Yeah. And in a sense, he probably had more time to, <laughs> to <laughs> concentrate and think because there was not really anything else to do. And he couldn't get involved <laughs> in political battles and, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, military battles or political intrigues. But anyway, yeah, so a number of, a, a lot of his work or a good amount of his work was actually um, done yeah. in prison. So it was yeah. a double-edged sword. It actually enabled him to perhaps uh, not be diverted from campaigning and freeing Christians and Jews from oppressors, as he was doing on other occasions. Well, yes. thank you for that um, uh, fascinating summary. Uh, as I say, um, in your book, there, there is a, a, a summary as well uh, that you've just given a slightly more detail if you wanted to follow that up for free in the link below. Now, in chapters one and two of your book, uh, you give a historical background on the question of reason and revelation in Islamic thought up to the time of Ibn Taymiyyah. Now, this is a really important issue, reason and revelation. What was this all about? Um, and how did it look to Ibn Taymiyyah in the 8th slash 14th century? Yeah, so basically this um, dichotomy, reason and revelation, is something that goes back very early in Islamic history. And um, we all have minds, we all have reason. Uh, human beings have a notion of what it means to kind of think rationally and what reason tells us. Of course, this can be understood differently in different times and places. The Greeks had a very specific way of construing reason and of uh, uh, theorizing about it and so forth. Um, other, other cultures might have a different way of doing that, but we all sort of, you know, the, the fact that we are rational beings is something that we all know intuitively. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Islam as a scriptural tradition um, has a very strong and present notion of revelation. The Quran, of course, is a direct uh, word of God that's been preserved, that's been passed down. Uh, it's not the Prophet Muhammad's words. It's not his sort of inspired meanings that he clothed in his own language. It's literally the word of God. So revelation in, this, in the kind of strongest sense. So you have reason, you have revelation. And obviously revelation coming from God is, uh, is authoritative. I mean, God is a creator of the universe. He knows what he's talking about. At the same time, we trust our reason to be able to lead us to true and just conclusions about any number of, uh, of, of, of matters in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, can these two sources conflict? Is it possible for reason to tell us one thing, but for revelation to say something else? In other words, on the same topic. So we might say, oh, I've thought with my reason, I've reached X or Y rational conclusion. However, I look in the Quran and it seems to be contradicting that. Or I've read this in the Quran and then I thought about it and I, I realized that this is sort of irrational. The question is, can this happen? Can there be a conflict between the two? And if there is, then what do you do about it? Mm. And so over the centuries, um, the theologians, the rationalist theologians, particularly Ash'ari theologians, came up with a formula that they expressed in the terms of a rule, which they called the universal rule, Al-Qanun Al-Kulli in Arabic. And this basically states that, um, you know, we can look at it more closely, but it basically states that if reason and revelation conflict, then we have a number of possibilities. One, now say that are conflicting on something that is sort of logically um, 
exhaustive and mutually exclusive. So okay, either can, X or Y. This is, like, this is all very abstract, but can you actually yeah. give a concrete example of the kinds of um, uh, statements in the Quran, for example, that were perceived by some theologians to be mm -hmm in conflict with reason as understood, obviously in a particular kind of Greek Aristotelian sense, but what, what, sure. what was the actual meat and veg here? What was what was causing the problem? Okay, that they that's had a very good question. About? Sure. At the moment, it's too abstract for us to kind of think, well, what was the problem really? Yeah, okay, perfect. So I'll give an example I give in the, in the sort of preface, what I call the mise-en-scene in my, in my book, uh, it comes before the introduction. And this goes actually to the philosophers. So this was something that the philosophers held. So philosophers working under an Aristotelian paradigm conceived of God as being perfectly simple and unchangeable, completely immutable. Right. So if God is God, you know, everything that exists other than God, so the entire world, it comes into being, it's subject to uh, generation and demise and so forth. And God is completely other than the universe. And so he is completely immutable and unchangeable. And part of what they understood from this is that God's knowledge also, being a quality of God, also has to be completely unchangeable and, and, and uh, immutable. And so they drew from this the conclusion that God can only know uh, genuses, or he can only know essences or universal concepts, but he cannot know individuals. So God can have a concept of humanity. He knows what the essence of human beings are, mm -hmm. is the essence of human beings, but he doesn't know individual human beings. He doesn't know you. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know other people because we come and go. We come into existence, we change, we die. And if God were to know us individually, then it would mean that his knowledge is changing because the knowledge is related to the thing that is known. And right. so they said, no, 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 God's knowledge can't change because then it wouldn't be perfect. And so God can only know humanity in a generic sense. He can know what a leaf is in a generic sense, but he can't know the, the tree that's standing outside my window. And he can't have knowledge of the actual leaves that are on this specific tree because, again, they, they come into existence, they, you know, fly away, they, they, they fall off, they die, and this would introduce a change in God's knowledge. So they said God cannot know particulars, particular... Yeah, that's very interesting, because it seems to suggest that God um, it almost exists in time. So, you know, something comes into being, then it goes out of being. For God to know that means a change in God, and from a kind of a, a perfect Greek theology, God doesn't change, so he couldn't have knowledge mm -hmm. of particulars. But if God is outside exactly. of time, of course, if he's in a timeless dimension, a transcendent dimension, which obviously is beyond my understanding, then that wouldn't be a problem because he knows everything timelessly anyway. And so there's no before, during and after in a timeless sense, in this sequential sense at all. So um, right. it, it just struck me. So there, this is a bit of, there's even implied theology there that God exists within a kind of time frame uh, right. such that um, his knowledge is imperfect because he doesn't know everything as it's going to happen as well. Well, that's a very good uh, observation. And I think it also goes to the heart of what Ibn Taymiyyah would say that, you know, when you say things like this, there are a lot of hidden assumptions yes. that are packed into it. So as you just said, okay, well, that sounds, you know, maybe uh, plausible on the surface, but if we look a little bit deeper, we realize that it actually seems to be um, built on a particular metaphysical, on particular metaphysical assumptions, which may or may not be right. You know, those are obviously contestable. And so Ibn Taymiyyah would say, yes, this is often what happens. What passes for a reason, what is taken as reason, is not just reason simpliciter, you know, reason per se, what he would call al-aqal as-sarih, which is something like pure reason, you know, I mean, I'm not talking about Immanuel Kant here, uh, but, you know, just pure reason in his sense, right? What he would say is that the reason that is coming to us through the Greeks or through any other type of philosophical system is off, is already pre-committed to a whole set of metaphysical and ontological assumptions right, that are right. themselves questionable and that we should actually question. And so before just taking on that, okay, reason, quote unquote, says this, we need to do our homework and dig deeper and see, well, what are the premises that are undergirding this notion of reason? Mm -hmm. So to come back to this issue of God knowing particulars, how does this conflict with revelation? Like, let's just assume for the sake of argument that yeah. reason actually does say what the philosophers understood from Aristotle, that, okay, God is completely simple, completely immutable, and cannot know particulars for that reason. Well, does this conflict with the Quran or not? Well, the Quran certainly seems to imply that God knows particulars. I mean, he speaks to people, he sends prophets, he sends messengers. But not only that, there are explicit verses, such as the one that says, Not a single leaf falls except that he knows it. Mm. Not a and single leaf, on, so any particular leaf in the universe, not, yeah. the, not the platonic form, the abstract concept of leaf, but that yeah. particular leaf, that particular leaf, God knows it. 
Perfectly. Right. And it even says, well, not a leaf falls except that he knows it. So, right. so this, okay. this goes beyond the shadow of a doubt that it's not, because it's talking about a leaf that's actually falling, it's doing something, right? And it's changing, it's moving, it's, it's yeah. you know, yeah. its state is, is being transmuted within the world. Yeah. And the Quran is very explicit. And then the verse goes on, nor any grain, tiny grain, you know, in, in, the, uh, in this land and under the sea and so forth. It's very, very particular. Every single tiny little thing, you know, God knows. And so right. this obviously, so if, the, if Revelation says that, but reason ostensibly says that God cannot know any particulars, well, clearly there's a conflict here. And so the question is, what do you do with this conflict? Right. right? This is, and this is an irreducible conflict. I mean, either reason, if that's really what it says, is right, and Revelation, at least on the surface, is is wrong, or what, it, or we can't understand it according to its obvious meaning, or Revelation is right and then reason is wrong, but they can't both be right if one is saying God know, can't know particulars and the other one is saying. God knows every single tiny little particular. So that's a clear conflict. Yeah. Can I just, to take it back a step further here, just the historical point, because well, when, when Islam was born in, in a historical sense in the, uh, uh, with the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, these were not issues that concerned the Sahaba. They're not. They're not. They're not there in. Uh, they're not there in the deeds. This is not. It's only was it not when uh, the Muslims uh, advanced into the Levant and North Africa, uh, ultimately into Spain. Persia, and not, yeah. not, um, encountering uh, other communities, obviously Christian communities, that also had encountered um, Greek philosophy in the form of Aristotle, this 500 BC dude from Greece, from Athens, you know, uh, and people like Plato and Socrates uh, and many others, and already imbued and taken on board great masses of Greek philosophy and metaphysics and theology within Christian theology. Uh, so the Muslim uh, thinkers and, and, and just explaining the Islamic faith had to speak to these people, had to explain their faith. And so they encountered Greek rationality, Greek philosophy. And that's when it became perhaps an issue where it hadn't perhaps been an issue right in the, in the seventh century, you know, in, in Medina, shall we say. I don't imagine mm -hmm. it was much of an issue there, but it became one as Muslims expanded into the wider world where it was a very powerful influence on pre-existing religions like Judaism ultimately uh, had the same thing with Maimonides in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Islamic Spain and, and elsewhere, You're heavily influenced by Greek thought patterns. So this is impacting the Abrahamic faith all over the place. And exactly. Islam, it seems, is just the latest um, religion to have to deal with this phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, and it dealt with it in a very interesting way, slightly differently, I think, from Christian theology is a different subject, but Christianity seems to have really taken on board completely Aristotelian metaphysics. See, is in the work of Thomas Aquinas, obviously in the 13th century in Paris, um, different area. But Islam dealt with it differently. But um, and Ibn Taymiyyah is a powerful voice, it seems, saying, hang on there. What are we talking about? Is this helpful? Is this really compatible with um, revelation at all? And is the concept of reason that's being offered here really as universal and as objective as it pretends to be? Maybe it's packed full of these assumptions, which are really toxic to some elements of revelation, which you've just described, of course. Right. Yeah, and what you say is exactly right. I mean, there are some indications that um, at the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, you know, one time he came across his uh, upon some of his companions, and they were debating this issue of the divine decree, Qadar. And, you know, okay, if God dec decrees everything beforehand or decrees everything, are we really responsible for our actions? And so this is sort of proto-theological, you know, you yes. could say theological in the formal sense, questioning. And, and the prophet, peace be upon him, came upon the, them and heard this, and he actually got upset. And he said, uh, you know, you should not dispute about these things because, you know, some things just go beyond our capacity to understand them. Mm. And it leads you down a very dark hole, basically. Um, and then he also said in another hadith that, um, you know, that sh Satan will come to you uh, and ask you who created this, who created that, mm. until he says, who created your Lord? Yeah. Right. And so to try to incite doubt by saying, okay, if everything has to be, everything has to be created that exists, well, then who created God? Oh, oh my gosh. And then you start doubting. And so he said, if one of you comes to that point where you start having those thoughts, then you should, you know, seek refuge in God, right? I seek refuge and desist, you know, kind of stop. So there are, you know, a few hadith here and there that talk about some sort of proto kind of um, theological questions that were raised. Yeah. Um, especially on things that are kind of inherently beyond the ken of, of human understanding. Uh, um, and the prophet sort of discouraged his companions from getting overly involved in these things. But what happens, as you say, is that once the Muslims spread and now have to start 
um, you, you know, dealing with objections raised from all sorts of different quarters, mm. uh, you can say, well, okay, the Quran says this, but these people don't believe in the Quran. They don't believe it's the word of God. So they're not really going to necessarily um, concede to that argument. Now you could say, well, all right, the Quran is sufficient. If you know how to speak with the Quran, then that should be enough to kind of, you, you know, uh, win people over or make them understand your position. But nevertheless, there was a need felt to kind of discourse with people on their own terms. And so the first school of theology that began was actually the Mu'tazidi school, which was one of the earliest schools of theology, which tried, you know, they were interested in defending Islam. And what they did is say, well, to def mount a defense for Islam, we need to speak to the this kind of intellectual context in its own language and in its own terms, in its own categories. Now, for the mainstream theologians, including the Ash'aris, right, who, who become the mainstream kind of later on um, in numerical terms, uh, the Mu'tazila, the mistake that they made is that they went too far in adopting, you know, sort of foreign assumptions, terms, and categories. So it's like you're trying to take on the enemy's tools, so to speak, or the opponent's tools to, to discuss with the enemy or the, the opponent, but at the same time, you end up taking on board too many of the assumptions. And again, the reason I'm fascinated in, in all of this is because we see the exact same thing happening today, yes. right? I mean, we live at a time where Muslims were uh, independent and confident and sort of dominant for over a thousand years, you know, almost 1,200 years of their history, almost all of their history, but the balance of power has shifted significantly in the world over the last 300 years, three to 500 years with the rise of modern Europe, obviously. And so now Muslims find themselves in a world not of their own making, and lots of claims are being made, both epistemological claims about what is knowledge and what is not knowledge. What we what can we say that human beings actually know? Can we know about the existence of God? Is it reasonable to believe in revelation and all these things anymore in a yeah. scientific age? And then there's all the, also ethical, you know, uh, uh, ethical theses that are put forward and religion in general and Islam in particular um, are, are is critiqued on uh, ethical grounds. Well, you know. Whatever and, and many issues that, that yeah, come up. I, I notice in, in in America it happens in in Europe as well. There are some uh, uh, Muslim leaders, intellectuals, and others who seem to have adopted the language of uh, non-Muslims when it comes to issues of gender and sexuality and mm -hmm. identity. Uh, uh, I maybe just using the language, trying to articulate a Muslim view, but sometimes even accepting uh, these non-Muslim categories uh, of exactly. gender completely uh, without any attempt to integrate uh, in any organic. Uh, way with an authentic way within the Quran and, and, and the Sunnah right. as understood obviously classically by by Muslims and so there's this huge pressure intellectual pressure uh, yep. for some they use the language others they go beyond just the language they actually adopt the concepts as well and change the religion uh, and I've noticed that becoming mm -hmm. a, quite a strong point not just on those subjects I mentioned but on other subjects as sure. well like the abortion issue for example recently some prominent Muslims were using the language of you know a woman's body it's her body her right to do mm -hmm rather than the chronic sense of, well, actually, God is the owner of the universe. We don't <laughs> own our bodies and decide what we want to do with them. We, he is our law, our creator. And so a very different discourse insinuates right. itself into uh, the, the expression of Islamic faith. And sometimes it can be very subtle, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, especially when your current context takes certain things so utterly for granted, like modern notions of kind of freedom and equality, mm. the sort of fixation on maximum personal liberty mm. and self-actualization. I mean, this is very peculiar to kind of the modern Western way of looking at things. It's not universal. Not that Muslims don't, you know, appreciate and, and freedom and so forth. Of course, we do in that sense. But this kind of obsession with I am born just to be maximally free of all constraints, social conventions, so on and so forth, like this completely autonomous, you know, free ranging individual in any kind of, uh, you know, uh, limit to my personal freedom as some type of, of evil imposition. I mean, this is all very, again, packed with a lot of assumptions, anthropological assumptions about who we are as human beings, theological assumptions, you know, even if they're very implicit, and so on and so forth. But because that is so central to the modern psychology, most people grow up in the modern world just it's so endemic that they don't even see that. And so even Muslims might grow up and just reproduce these notions that, okay, if Islam is, if Islam is true, then Islam must be about maximizing personal autonomy and freedom, because it's just taken for granted that that's kind of what life is all about. And then you can see sometimes defense, people will try to mount a defense of Islam by saying, oh, you're critiquing Islam on this issue, but no, no, this really is a, this really is an issue of 
maximizing freedom and equality. You just don't understand that. Let me kind of explain yeah, it. You say, yeah. wait a minute, why are you even adopting that assumption to begin with? I'm, 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 well, Islam you, is you, about you, servitude to God. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, a, exactly. In a sense, it's the opposite of, you know, like freedom. I mean, again, not that Muslims don't like freedom, but I mean, I'm not born to be as autonomous as possible. I'm, I'm born to be as perfect as possible a slave of God as I can be. I mean, that, that's, that, that's ultimate, and ultimate freedom comes through submission to God, right? That's completely almost like a diametrically opposed notion. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, you have to really dig to kind of see clearly that that's what it is. And when you speak, and then you say, okay, well, if I speak that way in the midst of a world which despises any notion of submission, slavery, servitude, these are all like very bad terms in the modern consciousness, for the modern consciousness, um, you know, I'm going to lose a debate. And you say, well, okay, fine. But if you, you know, what are you actually trying to, what, what is your message? And are you, yeah. what are you actually trying to get across? Maybe yeah. you need to try to get other people to question their assumptions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe bring, bring it back. It's yeah. not, I mean, Islam is a package deal. So you bring it back to God. You say, well, you know, the God exists. Uh, what, what, what has he said? Who is God? What has he revealed? Has he sent messages? What is his revelation? His yeah. book, his prophets. And you bring it back to that. And it's a package deal. It, 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 yeah. it's, it's an integrated whole. Um, so you move the ground from, uh, an obsession with uh, extreme notions of freedom and autonomy back to the existence of the fundamental realities, which is God and his creation and his will and his prophets and his revelation. So one has right. to shift the ground. But that's a big effort because one's not just arguing about the morality of this particular act. One's then trying to bring it back to a much more metaphysical, theological context and say, well, if we come exactly. back to God, what has he said? That's the question, not... Well, you know, what, what, what's the particular legislative point here? So it, it's, it's a big effort. Right. It's a big effort and you're trying to, you know, articulate your own position authentically. And at the same time, part of doing that is also critiquing what negates it. So what one could do here, I mean, this is not the topic of this conversation, but what one could do also is say, okay, here's what Islam actually calls for and, and affirms as being true. And then also, okay, this sort of obsessive notion of personal autonomy and freedom, is it even coherent? Like, are you actually free the way you think you are? Or are you just slave to something else that you don't see? You think you're free? Well, why does everyone have the same opinion on every topic? And the opinions change every five years. There's a whole new moral system this, this, put in place. Is, and everyone just signs so on. Well, this is how so are you free? I mean, why are you all thinking the same thing if you're that exactly. free? Exactly. It's what Guy, Guy Eaton said, the, the British Muslim writer in his book, Islam, the Destiny Man, made exactly the point. He says, the Westerner mm -hmm. prides himself, I'm paraphrasing, prides himself of thinking for himself and reaching individual conclusions based on his own evidence. But it's surprising that everyone actually thinks the same way. And we keep on shifting uh, our ground mm -hmm. to a new set of parameters and views uh, en masse, every five years and we're all doing it together isn't that so we're not really individuals the amount of uh, basically cultural indoctrination is very powerful and very very widespread but we all think that we're individuals making our own minds up it just happens to be we all agree on the same thing even though five years ago it was something else and five years before that it was something else right so then you could say this idea of this personal autonomy is just a figment of the imagination and oh, in right. real life no one's really free in that sense so if you're going to be if you're not going to be radically autonomous, then you should choose what you're going to be submitting to. And then you then you can have a discussion. You're going to submit to God and his revelation, or you're going to submit to the whims of, you know, constantly changing whims of society that's not really rooted in anything very deep. You know, that's like, that's now a meaningful conversation. But sometimes you have to kind of, um, you know, it's la ilaha illallah, right? There is no God, small g, but God, right? So you have to negate and then you affirm. So I think because the two, uh, laughter is something out of it is no, it is negation. Yeah. But the first word shahada is actually negative. There is right. no God worthy to be worshipped but God. Uh, but th this is all, I mean, people think, well, what's it got to do with the Ibn Timir? It's got everything to do with the Ibn Timir because he provides this paradigm, this, this great sort of methodological uh, orientation to uh, go back to the original source, of the, which is in his case, the Quran, the Sunnah, as understood by the earliest generations, rather than just kind of follow the zeitgeist and the trends of Greek or modern uh, uh, ideologies, uh, and even just using their language, but especially using the concepts that are, are kind of inbuilt in this language. And that's very, uh, very subversive. And he's saying, beware, beware, this is dangerous, I think. Right. And, and also the, the importance of language because words are not innocent. No. And when you use language, they're, you, you know, the words you use are encoding particular assumptions. They, they come embedded with certain assumptions. And, and so uh, you can't just also take on the language of everyone around you and repeat it without also taking on their deeper metaphysical commitments and assumptions. And that's something that Muslims, I think, have to be very aware of in any age, right? When you start, again, using even words like that seem innocent, like freedom, equality, mm. like, well, what do you mean by that? Or, or exactly. rationality or something like that. 
Uh, all of these have to be critiqued, which is another kind of modern uh, preoccupation, a pre-modern, let's critique, okay, yeah, let's critique, if Temi would agree with that, like, let's critique these words and concepts, you know, and do so very critically, but based on what he would consider true reason, which mm-hmm. for him is, cannot, you know, does not contradict authentic That's information, right. and that kind of takes us back to his project. So. Okay, so, okay, so moving on, in chapter three, you break down what you identify as 38 arguments against mm-hmm. the universal rule, which you're you beginning to explain. And of course, what we, we know, having read your book, that there aren't really 30, 38 separate distinct arguments. There's a lot of overlap and, and so on. But nevertheless, there is a substantial body of argumentation he presents mm-hmm. against the... So could you just remind us what the universal rule is and, and what uh, and some of Ibn Taymiyyah's responses to this? Sure. So maybe I can share some slides in order to do this. I actually have the universal rule um, on a slide. So let me just... And this, for me, is the the heart, uh, for me personally, this is the heart of the matter of Ibn Taymiyyah's brilliance as a scholar, um, is his interrogation of this rule and his alternative um, to it. So, Okay, so here's this on the very first page of the Dara the very first page of these 10 volumes. uh, He says, they say, and he's referring to the theologians, but he doesn't name any names. And he, he says, they say, and then he quotes, And what he quotes is this in English, if scriptural and rational indications or reason and revelation or the obvious outward meaning of the revealed texts and the definitive conclusions of rational thought or other ways of phrasing it are in conflict. So if reason and revelation are in conflict, then either there are four possibilities here. They must both be accepted, which is impossible, as this would violate the law of non-contradiction, basic rule of thought. So God knows particulars. God can't know particulars. That's a conflict. So we can't accept both of these at the same time because that would be a contradiction. Yeah. Or they must both be rejected, which is also impossible as this would violate the law of the excluded middle, especially again, if they're logically exhaustive and mutually exclusive propositions, like God knows particulars or he doesn't, like it has to be one or the other. So you can't say neither is true because then you would be violating this other basic rule of thought, which is the law of the excluded middle, that neither P nor not P. So we can't accept both, we can't reject both. So what do we do? So the third possibility is precedence must be given to revelation, which is impossible since revelation is grounded in reason. He says, that reason is an asl or grounding of revelation. We'll talk about that means in a minute. Very important point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so precedence must be given to revelation, which is impossible since revelation is grounded in reason, such that if we were to give priority to the former, over the latter, that is to revelation over reason, this would amount to a rejection of both reason and, by extension, that which is grounded in reason, i.e. revelation. So in other words, if revelation depends on reason, and I'll talk about what that means in a second, if revelation is depends on reason and you impugn or undermine reason, then revelation will fall with it because revelation is depending on, you know, our knowledge of the truth of revelation is depending in some sense on our reason. And so, for, so, therefore, one must, for, give precedence to reason over revelation if the two conflict. And then either interpret scripture figuratively in order to accord with reason, and this is what's called ta'wil, or simply negate the apparent meaning of scripture, but refrain from assigning to it any definite particular metaphorical meaning. And to do that, so to, ref, you know, to, to refrain from assigning so to negate the apparent meaning, but refrain from assigning any metaphorical meaning is called tafwid. So these are the two uh, procedures that the, uh, that the theologians particularly would prescribe in the case of a conflict. So if we take it back to, again, our philosophical example from the philosophy, now the, the, the Ash'aris and the, the theologians didn't hold that God cannot know particulars, the, the, the philosophers did, but I'm just using that because it's such a clear example. So reason ostensibly says God cannot know particulars. Revelation said God knows every single particular. I can't accept those both as true at the same time. I can't reject them both as false at the same time. And so if I say that revelation trumps reason, I'm undermining revelation because I only know revelation is true through my reason, essentially. Hmm. And so if I undermine reason, then reason's testimony you, to you, the you truth. Cut the, you cut the branch off that you're sitting on, which enables exactly, you to yeah, the branch exactly. in the first place. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So I have to sort of go with the rational conclusion. Okay, again, for the philosophers, uh, all right, so God can't know particulars. I know that for sure because reason tells me. If Revelation seems to be saying otherwise, well, I either reinterpret it figuratively. It doesn't really mean every leaf. It doesn't really mean that leaves fall. It means something else. You give it a different meaning. Yeah. 
meaning. Or you say, okay, I certainly am not going to affirm the ostensible meaning that God knows every leaf that falls, because I know from reason that that can't be the case. But I'm just going to kind of refrain and say, I don't really know what it means. God knows best. I believe in it from God, but I don't really know what this means. And I'm not going to venture to assign a specific metaphorical meaning to it. But I don't affirm the apparent meaning. And then I'm safe. And and, and, and I've kind of resolve this conflict between reason and revelation. So Ibn Taymiyyah says on the very first page of the Dar Tara, they say, and then he quotes this. Now, this um, uh, this sort of paraphrase of the universal law is very close to uh, the formulation of it given by Fakhreddin Razi, who dies in the year um, uh, 506-1209, which is just two generations before Ibn Taymiyyah. And Razi is sort of one of the great kind of Ash'ari theologians, and certainly the greatest Ash'ari theologian prior to the birth of Ibn Taymiyyah. The school goes on after Ibn Taymiyyah and produces a number of also, you know, uh, great uh, later figures as well. But Razi is sort of the kind of emblematic representative of the Ash'ari school uh, mm-hmm. and, and its most kind of developed form uh, mm-hmm. prior to Ibn Taymiyyah. So he basically um, uh, uh, cites a uh, formulation of the universal law, which is very close to Razi's formulation, and therefore basically is, is attacking Razi directly and through Razi Ashradism, later Ashradism, more, more generally. I, I just want to clarify here, j- 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 just being slightly cynical for a second. Uh, can we say that Ibn Taymiyyah, in his paraphrasing uh, of mm-hmm. the universal law, has been accurate and fair to uh, uh, Razi's exposition of it i mean because the, the, the whole problem we notice in contemporary debates is people straw man each other they create yeah. these kind of uh uh you know, ex- distorted extreme versions of the truth and say then then refute that and say ah oh, your position has been refuted which you know actually accurately presented it so is it even tame a fair to his opponents in quoting them that's my question to you well so the the universal law as i said this formulation of it is actually very close to Razi's own formulation. So, yeah. so you know, the way he represents the law is accurate, you know, and you can find also before Razi was also articulated by Al-Ghazali, you know, who dies in 505, 1111. So, you know, a whole century before Razi and almost two centuries before Ibn Taymiyyah. So, so yeah, this statement of the universal law is what the theologians say. Right. It is very close to, you know, it, 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 in, in, in essence, for all intents and purposes, it is identical in substance to, you know, the, the formulations of the theologians themselves. And I would say in general, from what I found, I haven't read entire, Ibn Taymiyyah's entire corpus, but in the Dar Ta'arod, he, he quotes other people a lot. I mean, a lot of the book is like so-and-so has said, and he'll quote sometimes pages and pages, and then he'll go on to respond to it. And in my book, in one of the indexes, there is a, um, uh, you know, there's an index of Arabic passages where he quotes other scholars, and I, um, you know, give the Arabic, I give the English, you know, in the course of the book, the translation, then I also give the original Arabic in the index for those who want to see, okay, what does this actually say in Arabic, you know, to get the direct sort of knowledge of it. Um, and so I quote Ibn Taymiyyah in the Dar Ta'arud, but then I also double checked in each scholar's own original work. Wow. Right. And I found in almost every case, what he quoted is literally identical word for word I with see. what you find in their sources. And sometimes if there's like a word off, you'll often find if it's a properly edited source that there was another manuscript of Ibn Sina or al Ghazali or whatever that had the alternative. So it seems like he just had just access to a different manuscript than the modern editor. So he doesn't straw man people. He accurately, you, you check this, he accurately represents his opponent's views. Uh, and so, in other words, he's a reliable... Uh, um, from what, again, from what I've seen, I mean, does he never do it? I mean, that's an empirical question. You'd have to actually look at every single attribution that he ever makes. But I'm just saying, in you know, in the course of reading his 10 volumes, the, the, the quotes that I happen to be interested in, in, in um, reproducing in my book, you know, maybe 12, 15 of those uh, I looked and on every occasion I found them to be identical with. And that's with quite heartening because it's not always the case these days. People like to, you know, as I say, straw man people, but uh, um, exactly. even Timir wasn't in the habit of doing that, it seems, even if you haven't checked every possible instance. So, so I thank you for clarifying that. Sure. So then we can go on. And so Ibn Taymiyyah says, so he quotes this universal law, and then he says, this is invalid from a number of perspectives. He says, he says in Arabic from a number of different perspectives. And he said, there are 44 like critiques I have against this. And so ostensibly, he's going to give us 44 different arguments as to why this universal law is invalid. And um, I would say out of the 10 volumes, probably about two, two and a half volumes are actually uh, occupied with uh, elaborating these 
different uh, specific arguments against the universal law. And then the, the other seven or eight volumes, seven and a half to eight volumes, are him getting involved in substantive questions that were debated at his time and before his time, very complicated things about the attributes of God, about infinity, infinite sets, about eternity, about a whole bunch of different issues. Mm. But he says that, you know, putting all those issues to the side, the rule itself, just in its logical assumptions and its logical structure, is incoherent. And he says, I'm going to try to show why. And although he says there are 44 different arguments, I say in my in chapter three that th those are basically 38, because there are about 38 sort of discrete arguments that you can identify. And the other six really trail off into kind of very um, extensive disquisitions on a bunch of different substantive topics. So they're not really like specific arguments per se, but just much larger discourses. So anyway, and as you mentioned, those 38, they're not, although he presents them as like 38 different arguments, a lot of them overlap. And so what I try to do is I group them into overall themes. And I say, you know, once you group them, these 38 arguments and you break them down, you can see that what he's trying to do is he's trying to um, make three essential moves against the universal law. You know, with these like thirty-eight to forty, and this is one of the, one of the great one of the great benefits so of your your scholarly work uh, uh, in, in in this text is that you do besides that you do a lot of the hard labour for us because although uh, Ibn Timir is clear when he when he writes his arguments don't always as you say have discrete beginnings and ends and ni nice and all you know, like the other guy you mentioned uh, clear reasoning Immanuel Kant you briefly mentioned him if you read the critic of pure reason you know very ordered very German very structured and so on not always very clear. But yep. Demir's thought is not always like that. And so you've done a lot of the hard labor in your work and, and willowed down and systematized his thought to make it accessible to us as the reader, I think. Yeah, that's what I tried to do. Because again, even also in the Islamic tradition, you have people like Al-Ghazali, for example, very systematic writer, you know, he'll say yeah. this, you know, this question falls into five different, you know, sub questions, sub question one has four subsections. <laughs> it's like very, very, you know, kind of a, a, a systematic. Ibn Taymiyyah, like I said, I mean, his writing reflects the turbulence of his times. He was running to battle and coming back and writing some more and refuting this person coming back. Being going, going, to and 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 going to prison. Yeah, so, and so it's like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I, I find like at least what I've seen from him, I actually find that he's a very consistent thinker. I mean, despite all of this so sort of you know chaotic presentation, his thought is very very consistent. I mean, to, as far as I've been able to tell, but it, he doesn't really tell you what he's doing. He kind of just you know jumps on the horse and rides and kind of like refutes, and then it's up to you to sort of try to infer what his underlying principles right. are and his underlying quote unquote philosophy, which is, which, is what, which is what you do in your book, by the way. You bring well, that's what I try to do. Yeah, that's the and task yeah, I make them, Yeah, and and this is why it's so helpy. It kind of fleshes out. Uh, uh, his, his thought in a very, very clear way. So I do commend you for that. I, one of the, the pleasures of reading it, you really get a sense of a holistic uh, uh, and the, the implicit assumptions are made explicit for the reader. Very helpful. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. So, I mean, I, I hope it's accurate, uh, but it, it's, uh, you know, it was my best attempt at doing it. So, um, okay, so the, the main moves he tries to make against this uh, universal law. So we saw that universal law says that, you know, if reason and rev revelation conflict, you know, you either accept both, reject both, or you give priority to revelation over reason. And he says, we can't do that because reason is said to ground our knowledge of revelation. So Ibn Taymiyyah first sort of questions this assumption. What does it mean for reason to ground revelation? And what's normally meant by this is that, like I said, you know, our, our ascent to revelation on some level rests on rational uh, premises or a rational uh, investigation of the claim to revelation. I mean, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes uh, to the world. He has a particular, you know, particular things we know about his life, about his character. He obviously makes a claim that these words are coming to me from, from, from God. This is a revelation. I'm not just making it up and so forth. So this is a claim. It could be accepted or rejected. Yep. And the idea is that, you know, of course, there's an element of faith and God only guides and so forth. There's a non-rational, not an anti-rational, but a non-rational development to the whole thing or element to the whole thing. Nevertheless, what we believe in is not just willy-nilly. It's not just, you know, completely non-rational. The idea is that there are rational grounds also for belief, uh, belief in the existence of God, belief so, in the... So our reason grounds a revelation. Reason comes first, so this is suggested, uh, and we assent to, we interrogate, we understand, ah, yes, our reason says, go ahead, accept this as revelation. But the, exactly. the reason comes prior to and gives legitimation and grounding to revelation on this right. understanding. 
And the idea is that because before the claim of revelation is made, everyone possesses reason, right? And then the, a claim of revelation is made. There have been false claims of revelation. Even at the time of the prophet, there was this Musaylima, you know, towards the end of his life who said, oh, well, I'm a prophet too. Well, he was a false prophet. Okay, that's a claim to prophet. How can we know? You have to weigh Muhammad wasallam's claim to prophethood with Musaylima's or anyone else's, right? Mm-hmm. And so the idea is that reason, in a sense, is prior to revelation and kind of grounds it in that sense. And so, and so the idea that the... Um, for the theologians was, okay, so if you then later impugn reason when the two conflict, and then you say, well, we're going to distrust what reason has said on the issue of, say, God's knowledge of particulars or something else um, uh, in, 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 in order to give priority to revelation, then you're undercutting the witness of reason. And you're shooting yourself in the foot because it, how can well, you, you change the trust? metaphor? You're, you're cutting off the branch you're sitting on. I mean, there are lots right. of obvious cliches that we can come out with, but uh, right. the, the point is very clear. Yeah. And so, um, and so, so basically, so Ibn Taymiyyah says that what I'll, I'll just stop the share for a minute. What Ibn Taymiyyah says is that what we have to do is realize that reason is not just one thing. Yes. The rational faculty it has different processes, it has different kinds of conclusions that it can come to, different ways of reasoning, different kinds of premises. Some premises are valid, some are invalid. And so we don't have to um, we don't have to endorse everything that reason is said to have mm. come to, every conclusion that reason is said to have come to. All we have to do is know that the specific considerations on the basis of which reason has recommended to us the authenticity of revelation are true. Right. We need to know that yeah. reason in judging the prophetic claim and the prophetic character and the content of the Quranic message and so forth, that it is true and accurate in those things. And if it is, that's a, that's a question of, you know, its deliverances on those specific points. It yeah. doesn't mean that reason can't err in other yeah. uh, areas. Right. It might get involved in something else or reflect on something else and either start from a false premise or draw a false conclusion that doesn't actually flow from the premises or so forth. And that's fine. Reason is not perfect, and it doesn't have to be perfect in order for it to be sufficient grounds for us to trust revelation. So he tries to kind of break apart this notion that reason is just reason, quote unquote, just this one block yeah. thing, and you either accept reason in toto or reject it in toto. This is no. To me, was when I first came across as utterly brilliant because he was a man who single handedly fought outside of the box. He broke free of this seemingly axiomatic self-evident principle of the universal rule and and actually did something almost quite postmodern with it and sort of deconstructed yeah. it and recognized well there's some good this, this is true when it's applied this doesn't mean it's, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be accurate and reliable in all other instances so we need to be much more nuanced and sophisticated and i thought this was a, such a clever thing to do and, and i thought wow you know um kudos to ibn Taymi, if i may put it that way yeah and I think the uh, the modern application of this, because we mentioned before that, you know, reason today really comes to us in the form of kind of scientific reason, right? So we're not talking so much about abstract um, philosophy anymore in the modern no. age, but but we say, okay, well, re- science says, that's the big, yeah. I mean, that's the modern, modern paradigm is a scientific paradigm. We talk about a scientific worldview. And so... Um, science, obviously, there's there's uh, empirical investigation involved, but really there's a lot of extrapolation. Once you get into the level of theory, theorizing on the data that we observe, right? There's a whole debate about whether data itself can just be observed or if every observation is not already infested with theory. I mean, there are those debates in the philosophy of science, but just let's grant that you can kind of have pretty much sort of free observations of, of just reality out there. But nevertheless, when you start to come up with a theory of unseen realities and, and relationships and so forth that are meant to account for the phenomenon. Now you're getting into areas that, you know, are, again, built on assumptions, built on premises, built on metaphysics. I mean, particular metaphysical assumptions, even if they're not stated up front. I mean, mater- so, mater- materialism, of course, is the big uh, presupposition of many. Of course. Uh, yeah. think of today, that the ultimate reality is material. It, 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 the dunya is, is the only reality with which we have to do. And of course, this is directly opposite of the Islamic paradigm, which is the ultimately real is God. And, you know, so there's a, a paradigm difference here, um, which is operating in these two systems. Right. And, and so to apply what Ibn Taymiyyah does here with reason, kind of abstract reason to science, if he were alive today, he would say, okay, well, you can't just say, all right, well, science says this science and revelation science. says that, yeah, which yeah. do we believe? If we believe revelation, then we have to reject science and then we'll look like we're, you know, we don't know what we're talking about, we're unsophisticated. But if we accept science, quote unquote, what science says, then we have to kind of 
question revelation. And again, you find the same thing. Okay, well, it doesn't mean that literally Christians and, you know, a lot of modern Christians and Jews have gone through this process many times, you know, in the modern period. Okay, well, it doesn't literally mean that. That's what it seems to be saying, but it's just metaphorical and so on and so forth. And so you do either tatwil, you metaphorically reinterpret, or you do tafwid, which again is, okay, it doesn't mean what it is. Agnostic. We just don't know. Here's the we're agnostic as to the true meaning. So Ibn Taymiyyah would say, well, wait a minute, what is science? Science is not just all one thing. There are different sciences. Mm -hmm. I mean, biology is not chemistry. Chemistry is not, you know, physics. The, the, these are all different. Uh, and then any com specific conclusion of science, can there can be a whole range from like direct observation, which is for him and for the Islamic tradition in general, will be very high on the epistemic scale. I mean, direct observation is it gives us basically certain knowledge, right? Two very kind of abstract theor theoretical models that go way beyond the actual data and that are heavily dependent on antecedent assumptions and all yeah. of this stuff. And you say, wait a minute, I can reject the theory that is built on a bunch of philosophical assumptions, many of which I might not even accept to begin with, without quote unquote, rejecting science altogether, yeah. right? And so again, you have to break it down. It's not just science that speaks with one voice. Well, what are you talking about? A particular theory? Well, let's look at that particular theory. What are the empirical bases of the theory? How much uh, you know, of the theories is sort of like directly related to the empirical evidence? How much of it is kind of, in a sense, interpretation of it based on, again, a lot of these other extraneous commitments and so forth, right? And so you might say, okay, well, I'm justified in questioning X or Y scientific theory, it might be very good science, but it's based on a metaphysics that I don't adopt in the first place. Or in this case, you know, revelation is giving us very clear and definitive knowledge, whereas science is kind of conjectural, especially the more theoretical aspects of it are, by definition, almost always kind of conjectural um, to some degree and always open to revision and change and, and, and so forth. Mm. Um, and so you could take a very epistemologically principled stance in prioritizing revelation over some particular conclusion of, of science, right? But it doesn't mean that you're necessarily rejecting science altogether. Well, if you went to the doctor and had open heart surgery, you know, wouldn't you be relying on science and you're a hypocrite? Well, okay, that's different. Like you're talking about- open heart surgery is not theoretical physics. They're quite- it's not, Yeah, exactly. And they're, well, they're, they're both called thing. science. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, of yeah. course, right? And that's exactly what he would be saying. Mm -hmm. And I heard someone say one time in an interview, oh, this was an atheist, you know, he said, I get on an airplane and I see like a, a, a nun or a priest walking on. And I and I just think to myself, you're a, such a hypocrite, <laughs> you know, because obviously the nun or the priest, you know, represents sort of this religious kind of worldview. So why are you even on an airplane? Like you have no right being even on this because your entire worldview is a rejection of like everything that the modern world stands for, including exactly. what's at the heart of it, which is modern science. And this is, this is so, you know, this is so simplistic and, and kind of stupid, but, you know, many people do kind of sort of have this attitude. Um, and so, yeah, so so that is what he would say about the universal. I mean, this is just, I'm giving a very, very uh, brief overview. Yes, and um, uh, you can read, uh, as I keep on saying, you can uh, click on the link below and read the uh, original for all the, uh, the full details with uh, fantastic glossaries at the back explaining um, uh, complicated uh, Arabic terms and theological terms. Uh, and so on. lots of appendices, I recommend, uh, which really help to give you f further food for thought as well on that. Right. Sorry. And, and also, when you and I talked about this beforehand, I gave I, I did an interview two years ago, actually, in 2020 with uh, Shraib Malik mm. on my book as well. It's much longer than this one will be. It's like two hours and 40 minutes or something. So uh, I think you said you would put that in yeah, the link. I'll, link. I'll link to that video yeah, below. as well. Uh, people want to go much more into detail. I mean, there's there's a much yeah. more kind of... Um, uh, uh, detailed exposition of, of these things. We can't get to everything, obviously, in just one short interview. Um, but the second thing he does after saying, you know, questioning what it means that re for reason to ground our knowledge of revelation and saying, even if reason does ground our knowledge of revelation, which he concedes on some level, although he has a much more expansive notion of what reason is than kind of, you know, this sort of more narrow Aristotelian definition. Um, nevertheless, he says, it doesn't mean that we cannot impugn certain uh, um, conclusions of reason and, and still not be shooting ourselves in the foot. So that's the first, you know, uh, move he makes against this universal law. The next move he makes is that he says, what it is, the question is really one, not of reason versus revelation, the source of our knowledge, it's the quality of the knowledge. It's knowledge versus conjecture. And so it's, it, what counts is whether something, whether we know something conclusively Yaqinan, qata'an, these are the Arabic terms, or whether it's just vanni or kind of suppositional. And so what he does here is, uh, if we look here, we see that, you know, uh, a rational proof, okay, can either be conclusive, qata'i, or it can be inconclusive. 
right? A, a rational proof that's conclusive would be, for example, to put it in the form of just a, a, a uh, traditional syllogism, the validity of which Ibn Taymiyyah accepts, the, the formal validity of it. You know, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay, is this conclusion, uh, is this argument valid? Meaning, does the conclusion flow from the print? Yes, it does. If it's true that all men are mortal and that Socrates is a man, then it is true that Socrates is mortal. Now, is the, is the argument sound? For it to be sound, the premises have to also be true. Because I could say all men are green frogs, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is a green frog. Okay, that's a valid argument because that premise does fro- flow from, that conclusion does flow from those premises, but the argument is not sound because the premises yeah. are nonsense. They're not true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the major premise, all men are green frogs, that's not true. Yeah. Okay, so you could have a conclusive rational argument if the uh, if the argument itself is logically valid and very importantly, the premises are true premises. So it's possible if you have a true true premises and a valid argument that reason that you could have a conclusive rational proof. Again, Ibn Taymiyyah's own notion of reason goes beyond just kind of formal syllogistics, and he has a broader notion of what it means to have a rational proof and so forth, which is very important. We probably can't get into the details here, but you know, reason some of what reason says could in fact be conclusive. At the same time, there are other conclusions that reason might come to that are inconclusive. They might be vanni because they're based on premises that are not definitive. They might be based on premises that are, for example, um, not based on a priori truths, to use, again, sort of Kant's language, but based on, for synthetic. example, yes. yeah, synthetic, so based on inductive kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, observation of the world. Now, as it turns out, all of science, basically, especially theoretical science, is vanni in that sense, because it's all based on you know, extrapolating from a data set that's always changing, always expanding, never kind of, you know, definitively uh, cordoned off and, and, and done, done with. Um, and so, and so, in a sense, uh, scientific, especially theoretical scientific conclusions, by definition, and any honest scientist or philosopher of scientists, philosopher of science would concede this, that scientific theories are are inconclusive, they're vanni. They might be considered very highly probable, but they're never immune to kind of revision or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was nothing considered more certain than Newtonian physics. I mean, this is what the whole world, I mean, Kant himself was absolutely certain in the truth of Newtonian physics. Of course, he lived, you know, a whole century before Einstein. And all of a sudden, when you move into an Einsteinian paradigm, you realize, okay, Newtonian physics is in what they call empirically adequate on the level of the earth. We can continue to use it, but yeah. the metaphysical assumptions about space and time and so forth uh, are, are not compatible with Einsteinian assumptions. And if Einstein is right, then Newton was wrong. I yeah. mean, fundamentally in those in those metaphysical presuppositions, yet for several hundred years, I mean, Newtonian, the Newtonian accomplishment like inaugurates modern you know modern science per se and is 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 sort of emblematic of what modern science is all about um and and so if something as seemingly certain for like 200 years 225 years that newtonian physics seem to be absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt if even something that seems so certain can later be overturned by a subsequent paradigm that says wait a minute this whole notion of abstract mm-hmm. space and abstract time that are separate from each other this whole thing we have to scuttle and now start to think about space-time with a hyphen as this kind of like, you, you know, um, uh, integrated kind of thing. I, 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 was, I, just, I was speaking to Professor, Professor Keith Ward just uh, last week, a professor at, at Oxford in Christian theology. He was he talked about in 1905 when Einstein was uh, a patent clerk um, who, who wrote in 1905, uh, you know, his theory of general relativity, which would overturn uh, the, the the then current um, physics, but what it also overturned was materialism. That this, this mm-hmm. philosophical worldview that the ultimate constituent were these hard balls of matter, atoms that you know bounced off each other like billiard balls, mm-hmm. and so on. all of this went. We're doing a probability waves. We're dealing with quantum events. We're doing with fluctuations. Yep. We're dealing with, it. and this is not materialism. And the the role of the observer. Uh, in doing the experiments it is absolutely key. And the outcome of the experiments is not just a passive uh, um, subject. He, he, the, 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 the observer, consciousness itself is key to right. uh, reality, it seems. Um, so this is a paradigm shift that's still being born, I think, in many people's minds, not quite caught up yet with the science that materialism is actually refuted and dead. 
um, despite what some atheists might have you believe. Yeah, and, or at least seriously questioned. Yeah, I mean, the, the everyday experience of it is seriously questioned. You know, when you start saying that the observer affects reality and all of this, this completely kind of, you know, doesn't cohere with the mechanistic paradigm that is born in the 17th century, right? This is just this clock you know, yeah. like uh, Dawkins, the blind watchmaker, there's a watch just yeah, going on, it's just completely mechanical. Of the observer. Yeah, that's right. Minds that are just outside of it and kind of looking yeah. upon it. And, and yeah, of course, that's a particular model, but we don't think of it as a model because it's so intuitive to us that, yeah. you know, well, how could it be otherwise? But then a different paradigm comes on, you're like, wait a minute, wow, those were just assumptions? I thought that was just the way things were. And this is the kind of thing that in Temi says we always have to be very, you know, uh, keenly aware of. So anyway, so rational proof can give you sometimes conclusive knowledge, sometimes inconclusive. And then similarly, a scriptural proof, Dalil Nakli, can sometimes be conclusive and sometimes inconclusive. So for it to be conclusive, and this is well known in the Islamic sciences, particularly, um, you know, in usul al-fiqh, so legal theory, as well as the sciences of hadith and, and also Quran transmission, um, uh, for a scriptural text to give us conclusive knowledge, the text itself has to be of 100% uh, uh, you know, 100% authentic, beyond the shadow of a doubt. So it's thubut or authenticity. You know, we know for a fact that this is a text of revelation. But then in addition to that, its signification has to be completely univocal and indisputable. So when we're talking about uh, scriptural texts in Islam that are of indu indubitable authenticity, that would be the Quranic text, every verse of the Quran, because it was passed down by mass transmission in such a way as to avert any kind of uh, possibility of error or... or um, you know, lack of full certainty in its integrity, as well as a number of hadith, you know, a handful, if you're looking at just like word for word, a couple of hundred, if you're looking at the overall meanings of the hadith. So you have some relatively restricted number of hadith, and then the entire Quranic text fall under conclusive authenticity. Now, within these texts, right, uh, not everything that the Quran says or everything that the hadith says might be you know, univocal. I mean, some verses are reasonably open to interpretation, different interpretations based on the Arabic language, based on a whole bunch of other considerations. And so really, it's only if a text is of absolute, you know, indubitable, indubitable authenticity, and at the same time, bears only one meaning, right, that you can say this text means this and only this, mm. only in such a case, right, in such cases do exist, you know, can we say that revelation is actually uh, giving us knowledge that we can say is conclusive. Any other scenario would give us, you know, knowledge which, technically speaking, ep epistemically speaking, would be inconclusive. So if it's based on a hadith that's not, you know, mass transmitted or mutawatir, or if it's something that's based on either a mass transmitted hadith or a Quranic verse, all of all of which are mass transmitted, but it's open to different interpretations, then you could not say about any specific interpretation that this is the definitive meaning of the verse, right? So, so if you say this is the most likely interpretation, there is some level of inconclusiveness there, and so it would also be on this inconclusive or dhani side. You could have, to some you could have conclusive rational proof of, of, of a particular item, but but in, inconclusive scriptural proof. And so, right. uh, and in terms of the scales there, that they would weigh more heavily in favor of the conclusive rational proof rather than the inconclusive scriptural proof. I exactly. Guess. And it could be the opposite too. Yeah. And so, and that's going to, we're going to get to that um, uh, very shortly. And so if we look at the bottom here, both rational and scriptural proofs admit of being conclusive or inconclusive. Oh. So this is part of his project of, okay, let's break things down. Again, reason yeah. is not just one thing. Revelation is also not just one thing. Reason, you know, some of it can be conclusive, some of it inconclusive, revelation the same. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, he would say, when two things conflict, what reason allegedly says and what revelation, you know, seems to be saying, we have to not just sort of uh, apply this general rule that we either uh, always prioritize reason over revelation or always prioritize revelation over reason. We have to actually look at the specific uh, instance, the specific question, and look. And he says there are going to be one of four possibilities. So up here, I hope you can see the cursor, rational proof, right, can be either conclusive, as we see, we've seen in the last slide, or inconclusive. Similarly, scriptural proof here on the side can be conclusive or it can be inconclusive. Mm -hmm. So say we're talking about some issue. Um, the idea is if revelation and reason are both addressing something like this example we keep using of, you know, from the philosophers of God's knowledge of particulars, right? Then it's going to be one of four things. Either um, reason is conclusive on the point and revelation is also conclusive on the point. And if that's the case, 
then they cannot conflict because conclusive means that the source is actually actually co- corresponds to reality, you know, as it is in and of itself. This is a correspondence, you know, theory of truth, uh, right? And so, if if reason is actually conclusive on a point and revelation is actually conclusive on the same point, it means that they're both reflecting reality as it is, and so reality is unitary and coherent and, and one. And so they they could not conceivably conflict if they're both actually patani or conclusive. So yeah. here, both re- reason and revel the upshot is that both reason and revelation attest conclusively to one and the same fact. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I, Tony, I mean, you're giving examples uh, from uh, which I don't think anyone today worries about at all. This is whether or not God has knowledge of particulars. I, I've never come right. across a human being in today's world. Maybe they exist in. Harvard or Oxford, people do worry about this, but I'm not aware of any human being ever worrying about this. A more no, contemporary example, and we can't go, to, we can't discuss this in detail, otherwise it would derail the whole thing, would be, uh, to, to give an actual contemporary example of this, the existence of Adam and Eve as special creations. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we can't go into this, but you could use this, this schemata perhaps to some extent to say, you know, uh, what, what does script, scripture require? Does it require this uh, as a belief uh, that we should assent mm-hmm. to? Uh, the existence, the historical existence of Adam and Eve as special creations of God. My understanding is yes, but then what do I know? I'm not a scholar, but that seems to be my reading of the Quran. Um, it, you know, is that clear? Is it clear? yes? It is. The rational, you know, is it beyond reasonable doubt? Then you can look into the, the alleged evolution of hominids and human beings and Darwinian evil yep. going through all of that as well. Mm-hmm. And it's quite a complex process, but that would be, I think, uh, um, uh, an analogy, a modern example of this, exactly. rather than knowledge of particulars is not really interesting anymore. It's just not exactly right. Right. Um, Which is also sometimes why it's it's good to use that as an example because people are not like emotionally (laughs) I'm aware that's why you did that, but I want I wanted to really uh, charge it home because unless this has utility for us today, it's just theoretical. And and absolutely and and the existence of Adam and Eve is probably one of the most single pressing issues intellectually. And this issue has been addressed and it is being addressed. I'm not saying it's not been but this way Ibn Tamir's uh uh uh, uh, predominance chart, if you like, can actually be quite yep. useful. I agree with that. And I think any such issue can just be run, you know, through this. And that's a great example that you brought up. And as we go through this, we'll see how this can apply. So, you know, again, either they're both conclusive, and so re- revelation reason attests conclusive, conclusively to one and the same fact, or you might have a case in which you have a conclusive rational proof on something, but in, in scripture, you know, might address the same thing, but it might be inconclusive either inconclusive text or the meaning is so, so somewhat ambiguous. And so in this case, you would have a conclusive rational proof would then take precedence over the inconclusive scriptural proof. Yep. Now, in this case, it's not because it's reason that it's taking yeah. precedence as per the universal law. It's because it happens to be conclusive on this point. Yeah. And so you give weight to the epistemically superior you know, a source of knowledge. And if it's, if reason is actually definitive in this case and revelation is in, is inconclusive, then you go with what's conclusive over what's I, I, I just wonder if Razi had been alive, I, I know Razi died, what, a century before Ibn Timir yeah. was born, if only uh, that they had been contemporaries and Ibn Timir presented this to, to Razi, who of course was the preeminent articulator, I think, of the, uh, the universal rule. And what would Razi, I, I just can't think that Razi would have to have admitted that he was roundly beaten and said yep this is better this is much much better I, but, but we will never know i guess it would have been very interesting to see yes. obviously <laughs> and then we can also have so you know opposite of, of this lower left hand corner we have up here in the upper right hand corner mm-hmm. uh, you might have a case in which reason now is inconclusive but scripture is conclusive on something and so in that case the conclusive scriptural proof would take precedence over the inconclusive rational proof but again why is it taking precedence because it's conclusive and the other one is inconclusive, right? And so then the last category would be maybe both of them are addressing the same point, but they're both inconclusive. So, you know, we have an inconclusive rational proof or argument for something, and revelation also is inconclusive in the knowledge it gives us. And so both of them are inconclusive together. And in this case, you would just have to weigh off, you know, which is the stronger of the two. And so the stronger, the rajah of the two inconclusive proofs would take precedence over the weaker. So in some cases, it might be the scriptural proof, although they're both inconclusive, the scriptural proof is, you know, epistemically stronger than the rational proof, or maybe the rational proof might be stronger than the scriptural proof. So we would go with that one, because although it's not definitive, neither is a revelational one, and it happens to be stronger. And so what he's trying to say here is that it's not a question of reason taking as taken as a block or revelation taken as a block. What we need to do is break down 
each one into its constituent parts, realize that revelation consists of many different things, reason consists of many different things, each different component might sit in a different place on the epistemic scale of certainty, and what really matters is the epistemic quality of the proof in question, Brilliant. primarily, and not primarily its source in either reason or revelation. And so to take this to the modern day, as you said, you know, again, reason for us is basically science. I mean, applied reason in the form of like empirical science. And so, yes, all right, the Quran has always been understood and seems very clearly to state that Adam, peace be upon him, was sort of created uh, specially, kind of miraculously as a, as a fully grown human being, uh, not born of, you know, of some other creature and like grew up as a baby and all of that. And, and this obviously conflicts with the uh, contemporary uh, evolutionary paradigm, which would which would uh, reject this and say that human beings, yeah. again, you know, uh, evolved from previous hominids and so forth. Yeah. And so what do you do? And this has been, as you mentioned, a great kind of source of... So, so what do you do? I'm going to put you on this spot here. I mean, I know this is not <laughs> we, we were, we're not planning to do this. So it wasn't intended to do this. But what do you do then? Because I, 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 can we agree that scripture is pretty clear that it does say that? I mean, I, I, I'm not a scholar, so I'm just... Say, yeah, I would. Yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable saying that the Quran is sort of conclusive on the special creation of of, of Adam, right. um, uh, and uh, and and therefore we cannot accept that. Uh, you, you know, we cannot accept that there was not a individual that you know Adam who was specially created by God. The question is, you know, all right. Obviously, the evolutionary paradigm doesn't accept that. But but here you would have to ask the question. Okay, what is you know science in general, what is it doing? I would say, okay, science is looking at patterns that recur in the world and it's trying to come up with universal laws to explain those patterns, Yeah. right? By definition, something that is miraculous breaks the pattern. And so anything that's miraculous is not going to fall within the purview of science to begin with. And so to give a different example, and the Quran actually says this, you know, the likeness of Adam is the likeness of Jesus, or the likeness of Jesus is like the likeness of Adam, mm -hmm. right? It actually draws... Every single, you know, human being that has been born, say, after Adam and his wife has been born through normal human sexual reproduction, sperm, yeah. egg, gestation in the womb, birth, okay? That's been the case of every single human being, except we would say as Muslims, there is one man who lived in, you know, uh, Palestine 2,000 years ago who was not born in this manner. He was actually born of a virgin woman who had never been touched by a man who nevertheless conceived a baby and gave birth to him. Now, on the surface of it, Jesus Presumably, I mean, obviously he was born of, 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 of his mother, presumably had 46 chromosomes. I imagine if we were, to, you know, if they were to be able to do like tests at the time, right? And so to all intents and purposes, he looked like he was born like every other person, but we would hold that no, he was actually conceived miraculously speaking, right? Now, science could never confirm that because science would not, by the way it's designed, it is designed to um, recognize and account for patterns not the break of the pattern. So science would say, okay, if Jesus was born, if Jesus existed, then he must have come about through normal human sexual reproduction. That would be what they call uh, metaphysical naturalism. That is holding that the method of science is not just a methodological assumption, but it's actually a larger metaphysical commitment, yeah. that there cannot be anything that escapes the scientific view. There cannot be any process or, you know, ontologically speaking, there's no possibility of something having come about in a way other than what science could recognize. And so many modern people take on that assumption because they mix kind of the methodological naturalism of science with the metaphysical, you know, a deeper metaphysical commitment to, to materialism. And so, so in this sense, you know, science would, if taken as metaphysical naturalism, would say, no, a virgin birth is actually impossible because th there's no there's no force external to the material world that could possibly have brought that about. There's no God, there's no miracles, right? And so we know that this could not have happened because it breaks the scientific pattern. A more modest claim would say, okay, science cannot adjudicate this because if it did happen, it would have been a break. It would have represented a break in the pattern that science has created to investigate and discover. So by definition, science can only register patterns that's what it's designed to do and if something breaks a pattern then it's just not going to fall within the purview of science now if you have other grounds for believing that this happened right it would this would be an epistemological question on what grounds would one believe that mary for example gave birth to, uh, as a virgin or was impregnated as a virgin and gave birth to a child you know you would have to have pretty strong epistemic grounds to believe something like that because you know if someone just came to me 
and said, oh, look, this woman's pregnant. By the way, she's a virgin. I, was, I would not be inclined to believe that. I'm glad to right? hear that. I'm glad to hear It's not the way things normally work. Now, is it metaphysically impossible? Of course, as Muslims, we say, no, it's not, because we understand that these patterns that science are, is uncovering are, are not, uh, you, you know, they're not deterministic and necessary. They're, they're simply God's way of running the universe. They're God's habit, his pattern, his ada or sunnah in the world. And because he's in control of every atom at every moment, he could break the pattern whenever he wants. He's perfectly free to do that. So it's not metaphysically or ontologically impossible for us. But we also wouldn't just gullibly believe every kind of claim. Yeah. Uh, uh, but for us, we would say we actually have epistemic grounds to hold this, and our epistemic grounds are revelation, right? Because we uphold and maintain that the Quran actually is revelation. And so we we do have an epistemically reliable source on the basis of which to make this claim. Now, is this a scientific claim? No, it's not. No, because and, again, and so the, the problem then it would seem to be that the reason there's a problem at all is, is not the intrinsic merits of anything that you've said. It is the uh, the, the ubiquity, the, the Weltanschauung, the, the, German, the, yeah. the, the worldview that we inhabit now in the mm-hmm. world, uh, but especially in the West, is scientific. Uh, it is exactly. materialistic in its um, tenor. So it, it simply has squeezed out to the margins, metaphysical and theological uh, data uh, mm-hmm. from Revelation. So it's, it's, it's a plausibility structure that's the change. There's a difference. Exactly. Peter yeah. Bode, the, the American sociologist, have it, the plausibility structure, I, he used that expression. And, and so it's to do with habits of thought and the way we interrogate reality rather than the distinctive evidences of revelation and reason and science that are the issue here. Because your explanation makes sense. Uh, and I like the uh, I like the, the teasing offering there. You talk about Jesus' virgin birth. So Jesus would have had human DNA. So you would have had DNA from a mother and a father, even though he didn't have a father. I'm assuming if we could, if scientists could examine his DNA, that he would have the usual male and female chromosomes. So he was born yeah. of a, so he, this is a, clearly a case of miracle. Uh, he wouldn't have been human but, otherwise. That's the point. You would have had to have had that to be human at all. Um, yeah. So, and so to go back to the question of Adam, again, I think that scripturally, you know, we are committed to Adam himself, that individual having been, you know, right. created miraculously by God. If that is the case, right, that's not something that science can would be expected to pick up on or accommodate because it would be, at least according to the current paradigm, right, where science is trying to, you know, it understands life to have come about gradually, right, as a process, um, you know, if that if according to that scientific understanding, it's not possible for a creature to have just supervened upon that without being part of the process itself, right? But again, that's a larger commitment that science is not is not looking beyond what are predictable patterns. So, so that would be one thing. That this, so, so we could hold as Muslims that okay, perhaps the evolutionary understanding of current science is accurate overall. I mean, God, again, we would understand metaphysically that that's God creating everything. And maybe he did create things like slowly, you know, and change them slightly over time until one thing sort of gradually turned into another. That's pl- that's possible. We would, we would understand that as God being the one behind that anyway. So it would not be a, a, an atheistic kind of presumption on our part. We would understand that as just simply the way God decided, decided to create things. However, we would say even if he did create you know, everything else that way, when it came to the creation of man, right, understood as not just homo sapiens or the particular morphological, you know, like body, but who is this insan that we're talking about, that the Quran is talking about? Yeah, you had insan, oh man, who is this man? So we would say we have a particular body, but we also have the ruh or the spirit blown into us. We also have reason. We have language. God taught Adam the names of all things. We have moral responsibility, taklif. So there's all these different things that make us human. I think if if we saw anybody with our body um, and also could speak and think, but for example, had no moral sense, like literally the person had no, not just that they were very evil, but had literally had no concept of right and wrong. We'd say, okay, that's not a human being. I don't know what that is, but it's not a human being. <laughs> Looks like a human being, talks like a human being, very close. But you would say that's not a human being if the if if the entity has no moral sense whatsoever. So I'd say for us as Muslims, that's irreducible uh, moral sense. There are all these things that are irreducible to what it means to be a human. So we 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 might say that okay, maybe God created all of these other entities, you know, gradually. But when He decided that He wanted to create a human being, and and endow this human being with a special uh, mission on earth, which was to carry the moral law, the khilafa, you know, this kind of vicegerency on the earth and so forth, he decided that he would create 
this creature and he created it the way he said he did in the Quran. He created the body, then he blew his spirit into it and so forth. And then the creature came to be alive as an adult, you know, fully formed human being. Is this miraculous? Yes, but that's fine. We don't have any problem affirming miracles because there's no Muslim who doesn't believe in the virgin birth. I mean, if you deny it, you kind of, you've denied the Quran. There's no Muslim who doesn't believe. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention their names. It would be inappropriate, but there is a certain well-known uh, YouTuber um, Muslim scholar. I mean, he really is a mufti. Um, yeah. So no more than that. Who publicly denies the virgin birth on the grounds that the Quran doesn't teach it. I'm not going to go there, by the way. But I, I'm just saying. Okay. There, I mean, there, are, yeah. there are unfortunate exceptions. <laughs> if you want to turn it into a hermeneutical debate, I mean, Ibn Taymiyyah would also have a lot to say about this. Mm. Um, I guess I'll stop the show. Ibn Taymiyyah would have a lot to say about this as well. Uh, you know, that's a question of can the Quran just mean anything we want it to mean? You know, I mean, how do you actually go about understanding it? How, how do you establish what it says or not? And again, we live in a postmodern environment which plays footloose and fancy free, you know, with texts which denies that texts actually have any inherent meaning, that it's possible to uh, uncover or even talk about authorial intent and so forth. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, you have exegesis, which is to try to get the meaning out of the text that's in it, and you have eisegesis, which is reading meanings into the text. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this throughout Islamic history, too. Many different groups have come up and said, well, we interpret this differently, we interpret that differently. So the question of, like, how do we interpret Revelation and establish what it actually says is a huge topic. And in fact, Ibn Taymiyyah says a lot about it, and chapter four of my book goes into that. We won't have time to do that today, uh -huh. but that is very important. But I'd say back to the question of, you know, like, uh, evolution is that we would say, you know, if one were to endorse for whatever empirical or scientific reasons, if one felt compelled, you know, given the current state of science to sort of endorse the overall evolutionary paradigm, we could simply say as Muslims, okay, fine, that's the way God created everything else. But when it came to human beings, to Adam specifically, he created him in a specific way. That's no different essentially from his having decided to create Jesus in a particular way, or the fact that Moses, you know, hit the Red Sea with his staff and it parted. That doesn't normally happen. I mean, I could go to any body of water and hit it with a stick until I blew in the face. I, I, I would not expect that it would, you know, open up into the, you know, the, this dry passageway with uh, the mountain like water on both sides as, as expressed in the Quran. But every Muslim, you know, we'd agree that, okay, th th these were all miracles. When Moses threw down his staff, it actually turned into a serpent and gobbled up the the, the, the staffs and, and ropes of the magicians and so forth. These are all miraculous uh, occurrences, and we don't have any problem as Muslims, you know, uh, affirming that this. And so if the first human being was created miraculously, so be it. And this, for us, you know, uh, it, although it's not a scientific conclusion, that's fine because we don't have a scientific worldview to begin with. And what, this sounds shocking to people. We don't have a scientific worldview. No, it doesn't mean we don't use science and, and benefit from it. But a scientific worldview, the Weltanschauung, as you said, it means that your, your view of what exists and how things work is limited to the scientific method. And of course, it's, I mean, it's that would just called scientism, isn't it? This, this the scientism, right. It's, and if that's your ideology worldview, of science rather than right. a, a tool, a mechanism, a way of of interrogating empirical reality, it then becomes a metaphysical worldview. People like Richard Dawkins famously yep. are, are uh, advocates of scientism in that sense as a, a militant ideology that excludes uh, on philosophical and theological grounds the sins of God, which is, of course, nothing, nothing. A scientist can't do that by definition because right. they're. That that's a philosophical that, making that kind of assumption yeah exactly and it's like the point is like if you're going to actually adopt a scientific worldview then how are you a muslim to begin with and i don't mean that you know to poke people in the eye but how is it scientific quote unquote to say that you know an angel came from an unseen realm and flew down to a man in seventh century arabia and delivered words from a transcendental yeah. god i mean that's not scientific either well, in the this, sense well, that science jinn, cannot... and angels and jinn and angels i mean there's a whole right. there's a whole uh, other realms dimensions of existence which interpenetrate with our existence on, on occasion okay. and what the problem is that? when you say in the modern world oh that's not scientific people say what are you saying you know like <laughs> You're not saying it's scientific. It's like it, as if you're therefore impugning the, the belief. No, I'm not doing that because we're not scientistic in that sense, yeah. right? It's not scientific, but that's because we would look at science as being one activity among many. It's one way of getting at some knowledge of certain aspects of reality. I mean, there's the there's the seen and the unseen. Science, by definition, is limited to the seen world, the seen empirically available world. In the Quran, uh, uh, Allah always talks about the unseen and the seen. Al-Ghayb wa shahada. And as I mentioned in the book, 
the ghaib is always mentioned first. The unseen is always mentioned first. So in fact, it's ontologically prior to the, to, to the scene. So science, I mean, is actually limited to a very specific aspect of reality, which is real, but it's only one aspect of reality and has no way of even getting to the unseen realm, right? And so, um, so science can do its work on the seen realm without us being committed metaphysically to the non-existence of any realm other than what science investigates. It's not complicated, you know, uh, uh, philosophically to understand that. But as you said, because we live in this particular world, right, uh, metaphysical claims or claims about an unseen reality are just, they're, they're not part of the lived reality of most modern people. Because again, we, we, we grow up from early on with this basically uh, assumptions of scientism baked into the way we talk, the way we explain things, the way we think about things. It's in our education. Um, uh, uh, and so we we kind of take that on unwittingly as our worldview. And even if a lot of us, I think modern Muslims, yeah, we believe in angels and jinn, we sort of tick it off on the box of our qidah. Do we really, like, is our actual worldview, like, infused with those realities as it was probably for people in the past or maybe people today in other cultures where, you know, the unseen is actually like a palpable part of their psychic reality. Like they actually think about it. They actually experience it. They actually are aware of it. Many of the, I always say, many of the uh, dua, the, the, pr the prayers that the prophet taught us, you know, when, when you say assalamu alaikum on each side, when you pray, you know, who are you saying Talking that to? Some the, say the, the congregation, the some say you're, the, right the, the angels, angels yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah. when you come into your house, you say assalamu alaikum, even if there's no one, no one home, quote unquote. Well, but there are angels there and you're, you're saying salam to the angels. So even some of these very simple practices of, of, of uh, supplications that we make, you know, are if you take those seriously and, and think about them and do them, that's actually reinforcing the reality of the unseen realm because you're actually interacting with it. You know, when you when you greet angels when you come home, well, okay, now, now you're aware that there are angels in, in your home. Mm -hmm. And that's not just like some, you know, cute, like uh, oh, flourish or something. Like, right. I mean, that, that's real. Like we, we, the prophet saw angels. He, he heard what they were saying. He knew when they were in, in the message, like, you know, he had privy to this unseen realm, which is unseen for most of us, but prophets and others sometimes are given you know, uh, access to that to that realm. It's it's very real, but you know, uh, it's the thing times. is is the the Quran uh, the the very first uh, sentence really of the second surah, the longest in the Quran. This is the scripture, the Quran, in which there is no doubt containing guidance for those who are mindful of God, who believe in the unseen. So that's mm -hmm. what, what's beyond their perception, literally the absent. Looking at Abdul Halim's translation here, this applies to the nature of God, the hereafter historical information not witnessed, etc., like the creation of Adam and Eve uh, and the hereafter and also the jinn and the angels. So that, that this, this scripture is precisely for those who believe in the unseen. It's a presupposition right. of believing in Islam at all that you accept the existence of the unseen. And that's at the very beginning of the Quran, like that's literally exactly. after the Fatiha, this like inaugurates the Quran. So it's like the exactly. very beginning. You know, if, if you have a problem with the unseen, okay, stop right there. You know, <laughs> but, but, but before getting on to anywhere else, like, let's just talk about, you know, line two of Surat al-Baqarah, you know, and until we move beyond that, the rest of it is, is, is going to be closed to you, right? Which is why I say, if someone comes and says, well, I have a scientific worldview, I mean, I've met modern Christians that, you know, I knew a woman once she went to church and she practiced, and she told me when she's like, I don't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. She's like, that's crazy. Like, she's like, I'm a nurse and I see every day how kids are born. And <laughs> I was like, I was taken aback. I'm like, wow, there's no Muslim who would like deny that, you know? Well, I mean, because, yeah. well, but we, we have bishops in the Church of England here, but Bishop um, uh, Jenkins, I forget his first name, uh, some years ago, who famously uh, not only denied the virgin birth, he denied the resurrection of Jesus as well. He, he said, I don't believe in a conjuring trick with bones. That was his expression. I'm not saying you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, by the way. But I'm giving his example because he also doubted the virgin birth of someone who was a bishop in the uh, David Jenkins. That was his name in right. Durham. Uh, who, so it is actually quite common in the Christian churches. Because because modern Christians have also very deeply imbibed essentially a, a materialistic and deterministic worldview. I mean, you know, this worldview grew up in Western Christendom and sort of took over. And I think for many people who try to hold on to religious faith, they've they've nevertheless been very deeply impacted by this. And so they look at, you know, m claims of miracles within their own, you know, tradition or scripture and react with incredulity, but that's based on assumptions that I would say, you know, are, are antithetical to 
re- the re- religious belief to begin with. So it's like choose your camp, right? But but don't you know, you know, if you're going to start mixing that way, if you're just going to be a hardcore determinist or materialist, then what are you doing anyway? Like in the business, I, I, the I, business I, of I, I think I mean, right, Jamie, of, Yeah, it's mm-hmm. relevant. It's not just a question of whether or not miracles, the unseen, happens. It's to do with questions of gender and identity and so on. You yep. choose. Choose your worldview here. <laughs> you know, e- either go with the secular liberal uh, paradigm and and all the, the tributaries that c- come out from that, or you accept one where God exists. God has sent messengers. He sent books and revelation and prophets and so on. You you need to be clear what your ground is on, uh, mm-hmm. rather than uh, and, and and be aware of the pressures also to go a certain way in our society because it's ubiquitous in the media and the state and. YouTube, yeah. wherever, uh, uh, certain assumptions, um, leading one all the time to see a world in a certain way. And I would also say, just to finish the point about evolution, you know, I had said, like, if one sort of feels compelled for whatever, you know, reasons, empirical or otherwise, to kind of accept the overall uh, evolutionary kind of story, mm-hmm. um, you know, one could do that and still simply say that Adam was an exception to that. Just like we say, yeah, we, we also accept that human beings are born in almost every case through normal sexual human reproduction. But, you know, we say that in the case of Jesus, peace be upon him, it's an exception. It's a miracle, no problem. At the same time, I don't think Muslims should feel that they have to bend over backwards necessarily to in, to sort of accommodate the evolutionary paradigm and start reading the Quran in all sorts of ways to, you know, sort of give maximal um, plausibility to it. Because I do think that there are very serious questions raised in the philosophy of science by philosophers of science who have nothing to do with religion or Islam or anything, but there are, you know, competing views as to whether scientific theories, again, abstraction scientific theories, uh, are, you know, are realistic accounts of reality that would be scientific realism, or whether they're just sort of empirically adequate, um, or whether they are simply useful models that help us predict and control data without actually corresponding, that would be anti-realism. There's pragmatism. I mean, and these are positions that are taken by philosophers of science of various persuasions, you know, whether believers or atheists, that has nothing to do with it. This is purely in terms of like their philosophical Yeah, uh, there's one very famous, I think it's an American professor of philosophy, Thomas Nagel, professor yes. of in New York, he, who's written some, uh, uh, I've read one of his books on this, and he, he questions the, the reigning uh, scientific views on that's a very important evolution. work it's called uh mind yes. and cosmos yes it's quite short Why although it's it's very condensed and i recommend that yes. and he's, an, he's an atheist and he's calling right. it the question uh, uh, on logical grounds this is not really um uh, a theory that holds up to critical examination right. of logical grounds. and metaphysical grounds he yeah. finds it very implausible yeah. and yeah. and i think that it's very important for muslims to be aware of critiques like that and mm-hmm. to also take them seriously and to not, therefore, you know, then you realize that because my question would be how much of the evolutionary story, I'm not a biologist, obviously, you know, is interpretation based on the data, but interpretation that is taking place within a worldview that is already secular and already materialistic. I mean, look, if you don't believe that God could have created things, you know, either species or, you know, human beings or whatever, then what? well, we must have gotten here somehow. Like, there must be some explanation and and therefore you know well okay fine it makes then it makes all of a sudden perfect intuitive sense well if there's no god who just created us then we must have gotten here like sort of gradually because how else how else would it have happened but once you're aware but, but that the also, universe, there has to be some ev- evolution becomes then almost an inevitable uh, be almost inevitable time uh, uh, and the the changes in the universe this becomes right. a obvious theory yeah and so, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things that can be raised against it. It's not the time for this discussion, but I think Muslims should, without being kind of, um, you know, anti-science, because we're not. And I, and, I, and I always say, like, Muslims at the height of, of, of Muslim power and flourishing, you know, our religious age and our scientific golden age were, were synonymous. They happened at the same time. Our great scientists that were produced, that took on the legacy of the Greeks, and the Indians and the Persians and other people and develop those. And, you know, uh, as we know, Ibn Haytham and optics, mm-hmm. al-Khwarizmi, I mean, the w- English word logarithm, I mean, algorithm comes from al-Khwarizmi. It's just yeah. a deformation of his name, right? Uh, the, 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 the zero, the calcul. I mean, uh, uh, the X, Y axis, right? And algebra, algebra is algebra. These are all Arabic words. Mm-hmm. So Muslims, you know, were actually in the forefront of science um, it was a different paradigm for modern science, but they did not have to become atheists in order to do this. And most of our scientists were actually believing Muslims. Mm. Um, and uh, and so it's important that Muslims realize that, that we can do science, 
without necessarily signing onto a scientific paradigm in a metaphysical sense, right? It can be an activity that we do where while our larger worldview and our notion of reality is grounded in the Quranic perspective, which is a much more expansive perspective that can incorporate the empirical and the material world, because that's part of it, it's the Shahada. But we know that reality goes well beyond that. And so scientific findings are all within that realm, but we have access to a much, much wider realm that's grounded in a transcendental truth that's actually stable throughout time and doesn't change. And so it also provides a stability to our worldview that the modern worldview is sorely lacking. And that's why it's changing so rapidly, because there are actually no sort of uh, roots, right? It's And there's a verse in the Quran that is so pregnant in, in, in this particular moment in time, where it says, have they not seen, you know, a goodly word, kalimatan tayyibah, kashajaratan tayyibah, like a goodly tree, asluha thabiton, wa faruha fissama. Have they not seen the goodly word, which I understand to be the shahada, the, the, the word of, of faith? There is no God but God, so the, the affirmation of the, of the truth. It's like a goodly tree whose roots are firmly planted and whose branches reach up into the sky. It gives its fruits at every moment by the leave of its Lord, right? So it's a huge tree, deeply grounded, it goes all the way up to the sky, and it gives fruits, it's productive, it shades people, it gives them nourishment. Mm. You know, we can understand this also spiritually and metaphorically. Mm. And then he con- contrasts this with a tree, a, a bad word, or a habif, you know, like a, 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 a yeah, like a bad word word or, or, a, or a trying to find the best uh, translation for that is like a like a rotten word is like a rotten tree so a rotten word would be the word of disbelief of kufr of atheism mm-hmm. of materialism all of these different things that would go against you know the the, the kalima la ilaha illallah right so this kind of uh, of of uh, facet word or or um what's the word i use i'm sorry i'm not i can't think of it right now um which is a, a, a good word and, and a word that was, well, a good and a bad word. A, yeah, a bad word, a word of untruth. And, and and is like a badly tree, yeah. or, or, you know, which uh, has been uprooted from the earth. Right. And then it says, so it has no roots. So because it has no roots, it can't stand and it can't go up. So if a tree is uprooted, it's just lying on its side, right? It, it's not firmly rooted and it also cannot ascend because you can only ascend if you're deeply rooted. Well, what I find it fascinating is it's strong it, it, if you've got deep roots. And then it says, uh, it has been uprooted from the earth. It has no fixity. And this to me is a perfect metaphor of our age. It has no fixity. Every five years, it's a whole different paradigm, a whole different set of, you know, you have to jump through all these hoops to try to keep up, right? It's like a kaleidoscope. You keep turning and you get different images, but it's just who knows what's going to come next. Right. Well, I, I, it's gender, I, I, sexual, I can, gender I can guess it's going to be incest and bestiality as a good thing. Uh, who for, knows? For our kids. That's my that's my prediction. It's anybody's but, guess, right? Yeah. And I always say malahem and parar. That comes to me all the It has no fixity. Why? Because the it's been cut off at the roots. The metaphysical roots have been cut off. Mm. And and this is the I think um, kind of danger of, of 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 the modern project. Right. It cuts off the metaphysical roots, mm. and and it sets materialism and science off on its own with no grounding and then you're just off on this wild bus and you have no idea what's going on when it's going to crash. Dostoevsky famously said of course in the 19th century the Russian novelist that without if God doesn't exist everything is possible in other right. words and anything goes basically. So and he, Nietzsche uh, sort of said the same thing too I mean Nietzsche yeah, although he was not just, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. himself a believer and he was kind of gave voice to nihilism and so forth but he he saw what the loss of God meant and he told late 19th century Europeans, you people are fooling yourselves. You're still living, in a sense, on the fumes of kind of Christian, you know, morality and things like that. But you don't understand that what you have done in the Enlightenment, what we have done by, quote unquote, killing God, you have not yet faced the full implications of it. Exactly. And he was prophetic, I mean, quote unquote, like in the English sense, secular he could see yeah. yeah, that he could and, see. That, that and he was very critical of, of, of my, my own favourite novelist, George Eliot, the marvellous uh, author, authoress, because she was a woman, of course, although mm-hmm. she used a man's name, uh, Middlemarch, is a brilliant, brilliant novel. But he was scathing, because uh, he was more or less contemporaries, because she was an atheist as well, mm-hmm. but 
the, the, the ho- her whole ethical system, the, the, there was a Christian infusion and ethos in her books. And he mm-hmm. was scathing Nietzsche. They said, why, why are you um, still retaining the, the, the vestiges of Christian morality when the metaphysical heart has gone? You know, you're an atheist. You've killed, killed God. And of course, this came true in the 20th century, with a lot of 21st century, a lot of literature in its celebration of ugliness, of depravity, of nihilism, of brokenness. You get it in art, in music, mm-hmm. uh, and in literature as well. So Nietzsche's prophecy uh, as a kind of secular prophet came true in the 20th century right. uh, when people threw off e- even George Eliot's kind of pretense Christian morality and embraced the void or embraced shaitan in, in a sense. Um, and, it's, and it has come to pass. We're now living in this mm-hmm. void. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So, and uh, this is applied to Mayan paradigms to the 21st yeah. century. It's uh, amazing. <laughs> so uh, perhaps we can conclude. It's actually been two hours. Um, oh my! Really? Wow. Well, okay. nearly two hours. Yeah. In this shorter version of, uh, of exactly yes. compared to we the didn't other, we didn't even get we didn't even just get as long. <laughs> we barely um, got through chapter three. We only got through five. chapter three, and even then we skimmed the surface. So, folks, do get your copy of this. There's a heart, there's a paperback, uh, as has been mentioned. You can have your own copy, but you can have this in PDF format. I will link to it below and to the uh, uh, the longer version of <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, which is actually the same length or perhaps even shorter, um, uh, but more perhaps more technical um, a discussion that you had before with uh, Dr. Professor Schwab, I think, uh, uh, as well. Yes. Um, but uh, thank you so much indeed for your for your time. I, I feel as if we digress so much. I don't know if I'm guilty of leading you astray on these highways and byways, but I, I'm I'm very thankful for what you have said, particularly on uh, applied to Timae Tim- and paradigms when it comes to evolution, Adam, the miraculous, the unseen, because the, the the example of you know God not knowing particulars, although it takes the passion out of it and is historically accurate, of course. Nevertheless, mm-hmm. it's not the point. The reason we like the reason we should, I think, read Tamir today is because he gives us tools with which to uh, navigate these perennial issues. We seem to be living in a a similar kind of world today, even though we're not in the 13th century, we're in the 21st. Remarkable, remarkably similar parallels, which you've noted in the book, actually, um, in our world today. So um, thank you very much for that. Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, no, you didn't lead me astray at all. I think it's uh, it's 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 good to you know speak about these kind of life issues to make it relevant, as you said. Uh, and I do thank you for having me on. And again, I would encourage those who are interested more in the technical details to check out the earlier interview. Um, it goes much more into the technical uh, details. And I also have another uh, interview that I did uh, last year uh, at Harvard that also goes through, I, I actually use this slide deck, but we also get a little bit further beyond. So I can send that to you to include as oh, well. Yes, um, that'd be very useful. And so that's good. I don't actually like to repeat myself over and over again, because there's no point. I mean, so it's good that we sort of, you know, took the interview in a more applied direction. And that way people yes, who are interested sure. in the technical details can, you know, check out the other interviews. And then uh, maybe as a trilogy, they sort of all come together yeah. um, in a meaningful way. Yeah, the point so, is to, to, to uh, benefit from Tim here today, rather than just as an archaeological interest of some distant past. We're not archaeologists exactly. or textual, t- textual historians. We're looking at something that is useful. Uh, uh, the Islamic tradition is a- a- ever a- a- ever lively and can, b- can bring fruit to bear e- even for us today, I think. So, well, Indeed. okay, we'll leave it there. So thank you again so much uh, for your expertise and your time and your excellent uh, work. Uh, and, um, well, until next time, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.